Welcome to the Creative and Account Podcast. This podcast was created to educate people about the world of advertising and branded content from the unique lens of two professionals working on opposite sides of the spectrum. I'm Frank DeLaRoyo, CEO and Creative Director at Straight Shot Post, a full-service post-production company that focuses on branded content. My co-host, Melissa Reisman, is an account director at BBDO, one of the largest and most well-respected agencies in the world. We hope to help you navigate through the challenges you'll face daily as you develop your career or business in this dynamic and quickly evolving field. It's been a heavy year, but I really do want to give some people, I really want to give you guys some really tactical advice about how our workflows have shifted and what we're doing now, um, at least in my end and post and uh, in, in what I'm seeing in production. And Melissa, please, as we go back and forth, I'd love to hear as we break down each topic, What's up at BBDO? You know, people want to know how it works at these big agencies. First thing let's talk about is team communication. I sh- I, that was the hardest thing to develop again because that was the thing where, you know, people would walk up to your desk. That doesn't happen anymore. I think why don't you go first and I'll, I'll jump in because I think we actually have very similar um, team communication mentalities. So a couple of things that we were trying to solve with our team communication was... How do we make sure everybody's on the same page? That was really difficult in the beginning. How do we track the work? Which I know there's many different ways to do that. It was happening in the office always, but I don't know what might be causing a delay or not, right? It's a lot harder to do that. And we're in a technical field. I will tell you right now, like I'm sure you guys are all aware, the biggest bottleneck in the whole thing is the internet right now. So if the internet went down, so goes a lot of things right now. Um, so we were really trying to figure out what can we do? And then for me also as a young company, culture building is, was really, really important at that point. So that was the another giant thing we had to conquer with our communication. And what we ended up settling on was, well, we pay for G Suite already. So I was like, let me go in and dig into what G Suite offers in its entirety that might be able to make up for the way other companies are communicating. And remember, um, I was in the Vayner office. I know how they communicated. And so I was able to, to really build off that. We ended up deciding that the most uh, organized way to do this, and it's funny because this is one of the things we're going to keep forever, mm-hmm. is how do we organize what's happening via email, what's happening via IM, what's happening in a virtual meeting, um, you know, and, and what would we ever need to even be in person for? And this is what we find out. Any general company talk is happening only via Hangouts and chat. So Gchat, for those of you, is is basically the same as Slack. Okay, so Slack is actually where I would say 80% of all communication is done. Gchat for us. That just basically means, and this is true, we do not email each other. There's never like an internal email. There's rarely an internal email, you know, Um, but... That email we reserved for clients uh, communication. So we do all chatting via Hangouts. We do, I got into the habit of getting everybody just like, hey, just call the person, man. And so the only rule is like, hey, if you're not going to be by your desk to receive the call, just let somebody know. We're obsessed about using Google Calendar. They block, will block out our hours. So I'll, like anytime somebody pings me and they want to jump on a call with me, I'm like, yo, check my calendar. Don't you see? I'm doing the podcast right now, guys. So, um, for me, it'll say I'm doing finance for an hour that I'm doing HR for an hour and a half that I'm taking lunch and all they can see that on the calendar. So we try to you do have that. lunch on there. I have lunch. I, I make them put in if they're taking 15 minute breaks. And so wow. they have, it's like, everything is on there just so that again, it's the same thing. I'm trying to help them build the routine back too, you know? And so like, what do you do when there's nothing to do is such a thing. So There's no water cooler, right? There's no cafeteria. There's no let's go and take a long lunch. I'm trying to help keep things somewhat organized. So my team knows the times of day where I'm most likely available. And they know if I'm in a meeting, especially if I'm in a client meeting. Um, So Google Calendar and blocking time has been huge. Gchat has been huge. If it's like a real conversation, we've set it up in advance for always with a Google Meet. And that's pretty much the three ways that we've done it in terms of the team side. The only things that are set up every day or weekly, every Monday morning, we have our Monday morning meeting, um, which those of you who follow us see our content about that. We basically meet every Monday. It's community building, brand building, internally culture building. We get together as the whole team gets together 
and we talk about each person talks about what something they learned in the past week. To me, that's the equivalent of happy hour that was happening, you know. Um, and people just get to get their shit out in that time. And we'll, it'll go as long as it needs to go. Sometimes it goes two hours and we just, we go. Have you ever thought about making that public for people to kind of listen into? It, well, it is public actually. Check it out on our YouTube. Um, some people are not comfortable. So the, the, the rule was I will put the videos out there, um, but it cannot taint the like, you know, <laughs> the temple of the Monday morning meeting. So if anyone feels like they may change what they speak about, because we get into all of it, just imagine what was happening the week of the election. Just imagine. And we have people from all different sides of the spectrum and everybody is here. It's, it's like, honestly, it's like, it's my favorite thing on the planet um, because we're such a diverse group. And can I uh, join? Oh, oh, you please come as a special guest to our Monday morning. <laughs> I will hold you to it. No, but I wanted it to be a surprise. Like I'd love to like surprise you for you, like not to know. And I'm just going to pop up one day. It would be Amaris. If you're going to surprise me, it would be, you'd hit up Amaris and she would, and she would get you in every Monday. So that's like a big thing that, that we do to keep the community um, together. And then every morning we do a little itiner. I do, I still do my nine 45 to 10 itinerary meeting with Amaris and then 10 to 10, 15 or 10 30. We always do a team meeting. It's mainly a central place where the, all I go is, does anybody have questions for me? Because throughout the day, I'm so busy that I just tell them to save it all. <laughs> and so I'll either get hit with questions from my team for different projects, or I'll just say, Brian, do you know what you're doing today? You make sure this and this and this get done. Good. You're good. John Luke, we need to get these six posts out. How are those coming? And it, that's it. It's just a, the little, the smallest reminder of like, do you what's go over a status document during that call or it's just free talking? So when it comes to the client stuff, it's mostly free talking, but that's because we, uh, when, when we jump into client communication, we have project management software. We have things that we are aware of, you know, and I just trust that people, you know, we're yeah, not yeah. dealing with nearly as much as you are, right? Um, to be fair. But I would say that, you know, I'm sure as we sharpen it, sometimes what I'll do at the end of the day is meet with Amaris and write down like, hey, these are the five things I got to remember to make sure we're good on tomorrow, you know? But yeah, usually they're the ones that are like, hey, just, you know, it, honestly, I'm the one that needs the reminders. So, you know, Kat will be like, just Dale, you were supposed to review my video yesterday. What's up with that? When are we yeah. meeting about it? That's like stuff that would happen in one of these little itinerary meetings. I don't know. That's smart. I mean, it's a good way also for them to just like have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you. So yeah, usually there's a lot of like from that, somebody might have something they need me for and I'll be like, all right, let's just jump into it. Everybody else can go. I'll jump into you, you know, a 15 minute thing with you and make sure you're good on whatever project you need help with. Um, the only other thing that we do consistently is again, they kind of know after lunch or so around midday, it's like there's time that I'm available for people to again, ask me stuff that they need. And then um, at the end of the day, they all know that I can jump in to any one of their things and do a check-in. So we, mm -hmm. five to six is always check-ins. And that's me checking in on whoever I think I, like whatever I need to know. And so they're always available in the last hour of the day to help give me updates and stuff. And that's pretty much the routine right there. Wow. Yeah, maybe it is a little different than mine, I lied. <laughs> Um, no, I do like how you guys use G Suite. I think that's great. I think a lot of companies are actually starting to go that route. I don't think we've gotten there yet. We still use um, Outlook and we actually just started using Microsoft Teams. So that's kind of our Slack. We don't use Slack. We use Microsoft Teams for that chat uh, mentality. I what our team does, we have you know separate groups where we talk with you know one person or my full account team, and we just um, you know kind of chat how you would on G Suite. Um, just trying to think. We do have Monday morning meetings, but we go over like a seventeen-page status document where we go over all of our projects. <laughs> so it's just. It's a lot, but it's it's actually great because normally we wouldn't go over that as a team, but because we're all working from home and there's a lot going on and I feel like there's a lot more projects and there's some, you know, junior people owning projects. We want to make sure, you know, we have communication across everything. So that's kind of what we use our status meetings for. 
Um, and I think everyone likes it. The only thing I would recommend and shout out to my team, we should be going on video more often. We get into the habit of not going on video and just talking. And yeah. that's something is just so easy to fall into that trap. And I'll be honest, I'm one of them too, because at first in the beginning, I missed that human interaction with my team. And I think everyone felt that. So I said every Thursday during our 930 status, let's put our video on and just chat because it just feels you know, more like yeah. we're in the office. Definitely. Uh, so I started that and then somehow it fell off the deep end. I think it's because it's a 9.30 a.m. meeting and I think everyone's still in their pajamas because a lot of people roll out of bed and work, um, possibly me included. So I think it's something that we do want to start doing again. I got a good one too. I had a, um, I had one of my team members request that the 10 a.m. itinerary meeting was moved to 10.10. They were like, you know, when I come in, I really, I really want to grab my coffee and like check my emails or whatever. And we did do that for, I don't know, six weeks or whatever. And then I was like, no, uh, no. If you want to do that, just do it after coming at nine. Cause that's what would happen in the office. You would get yeah. in at nine 50 before the meeting. Right. And there was a part of me that was like, wait a second. I just, what I realized was it's a slippery slope. There was nothing wrong with the suggestion at all. It was just, mm -hmm. there was a part of me that said, Hey, I want to make sure that 10 AM is when we go. And then, yeah, you can go and and dude, people are eating their breakfast. And I love it because I'm like, all right, this is it's all right. Get up. This is the time where you wake up. And you, you know, I'm coming in hot with the energy. I got my workout done. They always hear me. And I'm always like, ah, and I'm stretching and, and, and showing them the guns. And like that's the, like we we have fun with it, but that's I what might, gets the day going, you know. I might have to do a behind the scenes where I like video this and I'm just gonna join and I'm gonna like have to see your morning like mentality and I might share it for everyone on the podcast to see because I'm oh, kind God. of curious myself. I was told that, you know, cause th I'm usually like one, two, three minutes late, just checking in to make sure I know what I got to say that there's like a vibe pre when I get on the calls. Cause they're all in there. And then there's like the vibe when I do get on the calls that it shifts and I'm just, I think it's funny, but, um, I guess something in general, I would say is like coming from the leading the leadership standpoint, like in this, you know, if I came in, they know when I'm off. They know when I'm like, hey, uh, this was going on. How are you guys doing today? They're like, you're right, man. And that energy ripples through, even though it's virtual. It's so, so important. I, yeah, yeah, I do my best to come in. Good morning, everybody. How are you? And just like keep them in a zone of like, we're going to kick ass today, even though this shit sucks. And I am curious because I know that the no email thing is uh, uh, strange to some people. Do you, are you guys heavy on the emailing or has that changed since pandemic? Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, we're still heavy on emails. Emails don't change. Uh, we, I, one day I think I counted, it was like 150 emails oh, you sent day or something like that. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it's, I work mostly with clients, so I can't necessarily do that. We're not, yeah, no, we're not counting client emails. Okay. That's out I was of your like, control. this is team only internally. Cause oh, I remember only? sometimes, oh. sometimes I'd get an email that's like, Hey Dale, just wanted to check in and say hi. And I'm like, uh, oh. Don't ever email me that ever again, please. You know? Uh, no. Uh, my account team, if there's any like quick responses, everything is on Teams. But okay. a lot of times, all creative communication, so any feedback is all in emails because we want to keep everything on one thread. We haven't gotten Good. to the we point where all creative and production emails are on Teams, just knowing that you want to go back to that email and, and have it for reference. But it doesn't really bother me. I doesn't really. It's interesting what you're saying. I think this is actually a good time to jump into collaboration, um, cl like client communication and collaboration, because what was huge for us in being able to keep the team communication organized was the fact is we, we have used Asana as a project management tool. There's many different project management tools. Um, we happen to use Asana and specifically for video collaboration, and there's many different tools for this too. We go, we work with Frame.io and that, so feedback to your point, feedback that would be coming in from your team to your creative team, or even from, you know, the creative director to the uh, copywriter and art director working on the spot, you know, that kind of stuff. All of that is happening in frame. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm having a meeting, cause I am, you know, obviously I'm the only one allowed to break my own rules. If I'm having a meeting and I'm verbally giving notes, which we're pretty anti, 
they are writing them into frame as I do it. So Smart. there's always, there is a place. And for those of you who don't know, I'll give a little bit of context about Frame.io. It's essentially, if those of you who have Vimeo and use the Vimeo note giving feature, uh, Frame.io is just a more robust platform of that with a lot more security features that I don't really use as a small business, but if BBDO certainly would use it. Uh, yeah, so that's like all the notes get in there. You can draw and annotate on it. Um, we leave hashtags. So if it's a sound note, we'll say hashtag sound or whatever. Um, but we're using that as our main tool with clients and internally. Very interesting. So you don't send over a call recap after a call is done, making sure you've captured everything? No, actually. Well, let me be clear. Not if it's me giving notes. So for example, if I'm in a meeting with the editor and, and I'm, I'm giving notes. I'm seeing those notes. I'm on frame too. It's real time, by the way. So as they put in notes, I see the notes. And then I'll be like, yo, why didn't you put, hello? Why didn't you put that one in? Did you forget? That I'll do that. And uh, But by the end of the meeting, we can just, I can go through. We can just go, go through, through. everything. Yes. That's and smart. make sure all the notes for the video are in there. So that's um, actually better than, I mean, also you're dealing with production side. I'm dealing with clients at creative. So everything needs to be an email. But Gosh, if I had something like that, it would make things so much easier. So normally, you know, and just so you guys understand the workflow here, if we're cutting a, if we're cutting a, a spot for her company, if I'm not editing it, which I'm actually rarely editing these days, right? One of our editors will cut the spot. They're going to make sure that they're happy. They're going to work with their project manager who's aligned already and knows the story and who is it for and all that. I'm going in there and I'm going to get in there and I'm going to go through our alignment meeting with them. I'll give the first round of notes. Okay. And I'm really also doing the job just like the project manager is, but remember my guys are young and they're all learning. They're incredible. But you know, when, it, if it was for you guys, I would definitely be in there making sure that it's good. Then they're going to submit it to the agency to her side. And then her team is going to put their notes in. Then we do those notes. And then after they're happy, it's going to go to the brand. So there's, there, those are the basic layers. And so we always have built into our schedules the agency and then the uh, brand reviews. Yeah. So just so you know, or at least at, at my company, so when you send it to the agency, it goes at least to my, um, to BBDO, it would go to a producer. From there, the producer would share it with creatives, make sure it's approved from a creative standpoint. Then from there, they have to share it back down to the account team to make sure the account team is aligned with the creatives. And then from there, we let you know if there's any feedback, then it goes back to you. Then once it's good to go from the creative and the account side, then we send it to a client. So there's just another um, line item of approval, but totally Right, but great. see that, and just for clarity, for those of you on my side, we always tell our clients, guys, this is the step. So you could put statuses on the video, right? So in frame, when we're done, we flip that bad boy to needs review. Very clear. And then I'd be sending it to Melissa, the account manager. Hey, Melissa, your videos are ready for review. And we always remember, educate your clients, guys, on your workflow. That's key. They're human beings just like you. Don't be yes men. Teach them, help them, help you. We go in, I say, Melissa... After you've consolidated your reviews and all of your team's reviews, I don't care how many 50 people over there need to see it, do mm -hmm. not change the status until, it's, until done. it's done. And I will respect that someone on your team is the head that's going to make that call. Usually it's the account manager. <laughs> and um, her cat's meowing, guys, just so you know. But you're allowed to show. It. It's a boy, right? Yeah. It's <laughs> running away. <laughs> Never mind. So, um, <laughs> that's funny. So, uh, where was I? Oh, so what I would do is send it to the account manager. They're responsible for consolidating all the notes. When all the notes are in, you change that you either inform me or manually change the status to in progress and let us know on our editing thread, which is the other one, so the other big part of our client communication. There's one thread to rule them all. That's what I could say. And so we have one master edit thread. So in that edit thread where we put all of our frame links, where we communicate all sorts of issues with our clients, I'll tell her, email us on this thread that everything's consolidated and flip it to in progress. And that's mm -hmm. when I know that we're ready to go again. Because 
trust me, dudes, there's sometimes layers upon layers. And sometimes they're working with another agency or the PR company that they have to send it to before they could even send it to the brand. Definitely. Yep. So it to me, she's the one that has the hard job of wrangling all the troops to make sure that all the notes are in. Because I'll tell you, the worst thing that could happen is at the very end, somebody else, oh, the CEO actually never saw it. I hate that. Hey, can I get a cut? I know it's still in progress, but I really want to play it. How about this one? I really want to play it. At, we have a meeting coming up and I really want to show it at the meeting. And I'm like, this. I know this is the worst. Somebody's going to say something at the meeting that has nothing to do with this project. Yep. And then that happens. So we, we're we very big on, on the production side of making sure that the account side is responsible for consolidating all of the thoughts. Consolidated <laughs> feedback is so important. And that's across on your end. That's across on like my end. And my job is to make sure that I'm getting that from clients. And my biggest pet peeve myself is when I find out from clients, yep, this is consolidated feedback. And then to your point, you know, we hear, oh, sorry, one more person lays in. But at the same time, that's kind of part of at least my business is knowing, you know, you might think that it's done. But, you know, if they come back and they say that this is mandatory, this needs to get done, you and I will try to yeah. find a way to get it done. Look, the benefit of working with bigger agencies that have done this is they also know when I'm like, hey, you know what happens when the CEO wants to give notes and we've already color corrected it, right? She knows. It's just Old money. Rich. That's all it is. It's just money. So and you know how the game is. And if it's a big update, it's time and money. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. Basically, number one, there's the one thread to rule them all. We try to limit emails as much as possible. Put all of the conversation happening in this thread. Um, we also like to send uh, like a, we call it a producer packet, but essentially it's like how we liaison because all of our uh, tasks and deadlines and everything is built into Asana. So my team sees that, but as Melissa, I'm sure will tell you, dates change all the time. They're taken so seriously for some reason, even though everybody knows they're, they're never going to be kept to. Um, that's just a unique thing. They're always so hard on me and I'm like, okay, but like, it's going to be you that's going to end up taking more time to review it. So why don't we talk about that so that we don't mess this timeline up? Um, Especially a lot tighter timelines. They're always directional if they're like almost unattainable to meet. So I totally agree. Yeah. So we have that one email thread. We <laughs> communicate. I know this is a weird way to put it, but we communicate a lot with our clients. Actually, you know what, Melissa? I'll, I'll start. I forgot the most important part, guys. When I book any project, we always start with an alignment meeting. Always. And that it's called an alignment meeting. It's part of our process. And we're always asking um, four or five. I forget. I mean, I'm going to say the questions in a second, but they're always the same question. And we always make sure that we're on the call until we al are actually aligned on these answers. The first question is always, what is the story? And so I'm going to make something up here, but you know, it could be the story of a girl on her wedding day who gets Duncan because she's such a Duncan fan girl and, you know, um, spills it on her dress, but it's okay. So she gets the second one. Okay. Something as simple as that. I could tell you're not on the creative side down. <laughs> what? Why is that? Why? Was that, why? Was that just like too succinct? To, yeah, it was uh, just like, I, she doesn't care that she spilled coffee on her wedding dress. Like, oh, she just, definitely you know, is going to care. Yes, but you know, it's <laughs> know. meant to be, it's, it's meant to be fun or whatever. One. Sorry, right, it's fine. fine. Give me one then. Go ahead. Oh, you um, know, okay. One? It's about a guy who during a global pandemic picked up exercising and made it uh, part of his everyday life and got better uh, as a person in his life and also mentally and physically as a person. He started with a hardship of, you know, not knowing where the future would hold. And then he picked up exercising and realized that that was kind of his North star. And he figured out what he was supposed to do with the rest of his life because of it. It's a beautiful story, and I think it's related to a friend of mine. <laughs> you stupid man. All right, fine. So you know what we would do is she she obviously you know it's funny because we're role swapping. 
um, she would be the one that's going on and on about the, the, all of the, the details and, and all of the creative that, that came into it. And that's what happens, right? Cause she's in the weeds. She's been producing this thing for, you know, six months and she's got all these themes and thoughts that she wants to capture. And, um, you know, I'm in the meeting trying to help consolidate that into something that's actionable. So I'll take everything beautiful that she just said. Okay. So it's a story about how, uh, uh, a guy overcomes, you know, the adversity of losing his company in the pandemic, um, through working out and rebuilding his morning routine. Would you say, you know, if I told that story, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. Okay, boom. You follow me, fam? We got to get there. If they do not confirm, you go until you work it out. Then the next question would be, um, amazing, Melissa. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful story. How do you, what's the audience for this? Um, I would say the audience for this are millennials. Uh, possibly knowing that the main person that's in the story is a male, it's probably, I would say, male millennials. Okay. You know, what's funny here, guys, is usually we'll add one more element to this just to keep it more realistic, which is there's usually a brand attached, oh, right? Yeah. In our world, can you put, can you attach some Nike? Nike. Perfect. Okay. So great. So then I would be saying, oh, okay. So are you guys trying to reach out? Is the goal with this to really connect with millennial men? And, and I know it's probably workout gear. There's the tank tops and the shorts that you're really looking at, right? Yes. Um, male, male tank tops and shorts. Okay, great. Um, let, let's maybe talk a little bit about what are these people like, you know, um, clearly are they, are you trying to look at people that, um, have been curious about working out? Are you trying to get more people to work out? Or are you trying to reach people that already do work out, um, who are maybe struggling because, you know, they have to find a different way. What, what would you say? I would say it's people that are currently not working out, but we're re relating our brand to those people by saying that we get it, we know that it's hard. And once you try our tank tops and our, you know, our shoes, it gets you into a routine and you start to pick up these habits. So that's I kind see. of the goal. Okay, good. So we're looking at beginners. Yes. Got you. So, you know, if, if it ended up having a little bit more of an educational vibe, you'd be okay with that. Yeah, I would say so. Great, great, great. Boom. Now I know who it's for. And it does matter in, in the edit for sure. There's a giant difference between, you know, when you're catering to experts or beginners, when you're catering to different age groups, uh, you know, it's all about tactical empathy, which you'll hear me repeat in every podcast probably ever. But, um, okay, great. Third question is always how, what is the purpose of this video? Um, I was going to say tactical, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, basically we want people to have an emotional connection to our brand for people who might not, you know, I feel like a lot of people I have heard of Nike, but for, you know, first time beginners, we want them to go out and buy our product. So for us to create an emotional connection, anytime they see, you know, people that you know, or during a pandemic and trying to better their life, they think back to that amazing Nike commercial, which really spoke to them. And they're like, maybe I should go buy a pair of sneakers. So you're thinking, so this is really more about brand building. Are we not trying to sell the t-shirt here? Like, so is the primary goal more to build brand than it is to actually sell more shirts? That's correct. Okay, cool. So, you know, I know, I know you guys did this uh, incredible interview voiceover with this guy. Um, I, and I know there are some brand elements there. Are we saying, you know, do we want to save that part maybe for some social cutdowns, social cutdowns? You're usually selling more, right? That's more about the product. Yes. Okay, cool. So that's fine. Great. So I'm not going to even really, you know, we'll show him using Nike, but I don't, th I think it might be stronger if we don't even directly say Nike, you'll see him use the product. I agree. Okay. Awesome. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, and then the last question, which is always. Uh, uh, is always, okay, great. So now that I have all that, you know, how do you want to make, you know, how do you want to make us feel? What do you want people to feel when they see this video? 
I want them to feel connected. I want them to feel that they have someone, you know, that we are speaking to them um, and that we're inspiring them to get up and start working out and to start using our products. Okay. So I, I would say a combination work. of inspiration, um, sounds like. motivation, and, you know, um, it's also an awareness play too, but. Go on. I think it's just, we want to make sure that we're, you know, top of mind with the with consumers. We're trying to get our brand out there again, knowing that people know who we are, but, you know, might not go to us as a first, you know, selection. They might go to an Adidas. So we want to make sure we get those switchers to, to come to us. Right, right. But I mean, in terms of billing, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. You really want to make sure that this comes off relatable to people in the same situation. Yeah. I mean, I think that the the story itself, hopefully the content is, will do that. But, you know, it's key that I know when the thing is over, if they had to say two or three things that we, you know, relatability isn't necessarily something that I can, um, isn't exactly actionable. I can make them feel motivated. I can make them feel inspired for sure. Is there anything else that comes to your mind? Um, motivated, inspired. I would say those are probably the top two because this is an emotional film. Is there a performance aspect that you care about? I think for this film in particular, it's more about storytelling and it's more about, you know, it's sharing the guy's story him putting on the sneakers and the tank top for the subtle branding cues but it's more about connecting, you know, with something that everyday people are dealing with. So I would say it's just the motivation. Um, I, motivation is probably number one. Okay. I could work with that. And there you go. And then obviously the last question is, are we aligned? And normally I'll say it again. I'll say, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the story of this guy and he's overcoming adversity through learning how to work out from home while wearing Nike. And then she would say, yes, that's great. Then I would say, great. And the audience is going to be uh, millennial men that don't work out, that you're trying mm -hmm. to get to try your clothes to help get them to work out. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would have more, usually there's more of a breakdown there. What do they like? Where do they hang out? And some things like that, that we could get into um, on the call if they know. And then, um, the third question is, what is the purpose of the video? And usually I encourage them to go into the actual business purpose, which would be, do you want to sell more clothes? Do you want to build your brand more? You know, are you trying to make a particular statement on a subject? Um, you know, what exactly are, why are you making the video in the first place? Once they say, yeah, if, and then I will ask them, hey, so if, if I delivered that, we would be good, right? I might not say it like that, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I would have them confirm, yeah, honestly, that would be amazing. If you did that, we'd be set. And that is the first and biggest part of how we deal with our client communication. From there, I make the one thread to rule them all. I put those answers to the questions in it. I put in our Frame.io links. Um, I send a little producer packet, which has um, these things organized. If you guys want to see our producer packet, let me know. I'm happy to give that away as well. Um, and it has just a place for all the Frame.io links to go. It's just a it's kind of like representing what our Asana would be. It has the timeline and it has the deliverables in it in mm. a central place. That's that way cool. if things change on your end, you would co add comment, you know, how you can add on a Google sheet. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, um, I'll say, you know, at Melissa link is ready for you. And sometimes you could skip the email phase that way, you know, and there's like little drop downs and stuff like that. There's like a legal page if you need legal things. And so um, that's something that I'm trying to implement more but we don't have enough like real project managers here um, to maintain that. But we do with uh, one of our biggest clients and it's awesome because they have their, their project managers actually will keep it. it up to date. So good. Yeah. So that's, that, those are the, the real ways that we do it. And then we use, um, again, when it comes internally, we just rock Asana and we have all of our editing templates. And again, if you guys want to see those things, let me know. Always happy to share, do a video about those things. Uh, we use board views for some things. We use list views for other things. And like our whole editing workflow is in there. So that really is, that's how we do it.
Yeah, no, that's again, different than ours. We're just more straightforward and use Teams and Outlook. But um, some of the things that you're mentioning are really cool. If there's any way we can do that on our end, but I know some of those are more technical driven, so. Yeah, I mean, how have you found, do you find yourself doing lots of Google Meets with your clients? We only do Zoom or, with our I'm clients. Sorry, yeah. video chats with your clients. All the time. Yeah, every meeting we have with a client is, is a video call. How often would you say you're video calling Duncan during the week? Um, we have weekly meetings that are an hour long. And then any meeting that we have where we're presenting creative is normally about 30 to an hour long. So it really just depends on how many projects we're dealing with at a given time. I would say we're on the phone with them hmm, maybe like four hours during the week, like three or so. Is that, I feel like that's not too long. It's not a ton. I mean, but, but it's still that you have to, this is just important for people to know, like, yeah. Just because we're home doesn't mean we're not talking to each other all the damn time still. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially on the client side. And it's funny, I guess the one thing that is different, right, is I'm never having a meeting. I don't have a meeting presenting it to you, watching it with you live, and then having you give me notes. That has not happened since the pandemic. And it has been way better to not have somebody sitting over my shoulder. It's crazy because all editors know this. All creatives know this. We really just want to let... We just want to be able to do our job. That's why we do the alignment meeting, by the way, because they leave that meeting trusting that we're on the same page. And I am telling you, there's way less of a, no one has ever asked me after one of those to have to like sit down and do a full day with me. If we're going to do a day, it's at the very end for like, honestly, it's never had to happen because we give you all the dailies in frame. You can see all the footage. You can tag all the footage the way that you want. There's basically, you have as much control as you would ever want. If you really wanted to tell me what take and, and reaction to use, you could. And it's kind of impressive, though, once you establish, one, that you care about their work in the alignment meeting, and two, that you actually are trying to put an effort to see things the way they want it, not the way you want it. I never really have that problem. Mm -hmm. I have had two clients come over in this year of the pandemic. One wow. of them was old school. So she was going to... You know, that was, that was it. She didn't want to use frame or whatever. The other one, it was a narrative feature film. And he really just wanted to be there to support. He really didn't say much, but I would always ask him questions and back and forth. And like, we could have done it on a call, but in the specific case, we were working on details, you know, and we were trying things and I, I actually needed the, it was valuable to have the instant feedback mm -hmm. to see if something worked or not. So, you know, when it comes to short form, when it comes to branded, there's not as many options that you would go, right? Like, yeah, you, you know, this, the, the sort of options that you have are much more limited and there's usually a lot more development in these projects. So when I have those alignment meetings, they're pretty clear. Like the agency people know what they're trying to do with this because they've been, they spent a lot of time. And as, as you guys know from Melissa's awesome breakdown of account management, like there's a lot of work that goes into these creative briefs. Big, big note guys, dude, help them help you. That's the biggest I could say. Tell them how to work on your system. How are you with that? When you work with your production people and they're like, ask you to do something, you know, you're so used to Vimeo. How do you see links mostly? Is it Vimeo? Um, No, it's usually through whatever production vendor that we work with. Um, they usually send us their own links. So for example, it could be like whatever X vendor it is, they have their own links. I think wire drive is what they use. Okay. So it's just some platform, yeah. right? Yeah. Like it, I guess it's some platform. Yeah. That you, and you're able to give, is it like frame IO at all? Like you can put notes in there too, for them to see it on this thing, or you're usually sending them emails. No, usually sending them emails. See, was, come on guys. 2021. I, can you send me separately? Can you send me what that is? Because I'm kind of curious to see how it works. If I can share that with the powers that be, it could be easier. Because yeah, we don't we don't do that. I will happily. Then I'll share it with anybody that wants to know because I'm such a big proponent of making this process easier for both parties. It's just way more you know and efficient. That like yeah, absolutely. Um, the third thing that I want to talk about when it comes to remote workflow is project management. This has definitely changed, right? Yeah. Talk to me about timelines. 
Um, I mean, yes, timelines have changed. I actually think uh, some of our clients have started to restructure how they're planning out their yearly plans. So, you know, instead we would kind of be briefed on, let's say a holiday campaign. What was it? Two months before or so. And then now we're getting briefed well, well in advance, I would say about like four or five months before it happens, which is great. Uh, gives us a bit more time on our back end. And then also just knowing that production is going to take a little bit longer, knowing that live action, if we end up going that route, or if it's an animated route, an animated approach takes more time. That's actually impacted our timelines a bit because you're working with an animator. You're working with, you know, sharing piece by piece feedback in every animation stage before it gets to color to make sure that it's approved by clients. So that's obviously a bit um different versus like a tabletop approach where you're shooting products and you have clients on set and you're able to see it and the the you know uh rough cuts there are a little bit more straightforward versus an animated approach it's it's definitely um longer timelines um but overall i would say i think timelines have gotten a bit better but at the same time we do get these rush requests you know from clients i feel like that's still never going to change where they're like, here's this, and we need it in a week from now, and we got to figure it out. And you know, we still do. Uh, but I mean, I think our creatives are tech. You know, they're very much. They understand the business. They know how demanding it is, and they're they're on the ball with all the different changes that we we throw at them. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about from the production perspective? Like, you know, obviously, guys, like if you are curious what's happened to production like yes everybody must get tested before all productions usually within 48 hours of a shoot have you been on set at all in the uh, since the pandemic i've been on virtual sets but not on a physical set yeah okay well that, that's a big thing to talk about too right so how does that work for you where, where you normally would be on set next to a monitor what's happening now Everything is virtual. So basically they have someone as a cameraman who is basically having a Zoom and we're able to see everything that's going on the ground. And clients join those meetings as well. Like, and it's an all day long Zoom. Uh, I've once had two Zooms, two different shoots on the same day. One of them was on my computer and the other one was on my phone. That one was a bit difficult. So I had to like be on and watch both of them go on and like mute one versus the other. That one was um, a bit drastic and it's not an all the time thing, but just hey, can we say the one amazing thing about that though? What? If it was pre pandemic, <laughs> you couldn't be on both sets at the same both time. Set. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess you can say that. It was the worst doing that. So I, I'm not looking on the bright side, Dale. I I'm, hear you. I don't, like, I don't like to be in two places at once. So <laughs> I would much more prefer to not have to do that. Um, and then during the one break that I had, I was on another call. So it, it's been it's been more difficult, I would say, just from my perspective, because you, when you're on set, you're on set all day versus, you know, Right. If you're on set, you're on set from like a, let's say a nine to like three. Now it's a lot longer knowing that, you know, things have changed and people need more breaks and, you know, it's, everything's just taking a bit more longer and it is more expensive as well. Um, I know that I think across the board productions have gotten more expensive because of COVID precautions, uh, whether it be, you know, having people on set, they have to take precautions. They all have to get tested before going to set. So clients do need to pay for that uh, on any shoot in general. And I think, I don't mm -hmm. know if you've experienced that yourself. Yes, but we don't have to, luckily, you know, because we're on the crew side, yeah, because we have done data management for a couple of um, shoots, we're working on a feature length documentary right now too. I mean, they're literally about to drop 16 terabytes of footage on me this weekend, probably. So, and honestly, it's been tons of shipping. Um, if we're on set, like I said, but the productions cover those costs. And my guy will go and he'll get their rapid test because, and it's funny because one time I off, this is the, this is, you know, things I had to learn. The first time it happened, I offered to get, I said, hey, look, I'll, I'll get the COVID test. They said, no, no, you can't because it has to be from a specific facility that is approved. 
within a specific time frame. And each organization, this was for HBO. So each one of those places has different regulations. So the productions just cover it differently per shoot. But it has been like that. We've done two big virtual concerts uh, pre-recorded cool. where we had, you know, different singers and stuff. We're sending an iPhone footage that we had to organize. Um, we used frame that was frame was has cloud storage. It was super helpful to get that stuff there. Um, we used that also had real. So I had a drive ship that had the host footage on it shot on a nice camera. And then I had all these other people's iPhone footage coming in. And yeah, we have to bring that together. So the challenges in post are way more about, you know, working with different file formats and understanding how to get the best out of a screen recording, how to get the most out of an iPhone camera, which has become a very popular mode of grabbing content right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then your the biggest thing for us is really working with your side, you know, people on the account side or the, the producers or whoever to make them understand that the bottleneck is going to most likely be the internet speed of where not normally yours if you're if you own a business and you're paying like i am even though spectrum is horrible so the most that i can get is like four megabytes uploading at a time so if you needed me to send you big files i can't and you're not in the state or nearby enough to get it to you like that's a thing mm. so we've just been shipping drives all over the place that's been the biggest shift here's the pro tip and this is some crazy mm. it's gonna sound crazy what we have been doing is legit Ubering drives. <laughs> and it's amazing. Are you kidding? I swear to you. It's probably cheaper, depending on how far it is. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know. well, if I overnight it to Jersey or to Manhattan, it's one thing. I don't have to risk sending an intern or anything like that. I literally take the drives, put them in a bag. This is the process, guys. This is exactly what I do. I'll take the drives, put them in some sort of a thing. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes, you know, you don't even have to, which is hilarious. But I, and I, I would never have thought that this would be, I would never have been comfortable with this until we started, until a client did it. And then when the client did, I was like, whoa, what? So I'll take the two drives or whatever, call the car, put in the client's address or the colorist's address or whoever I'm sending it to, my AE's address sometimes. Go downstairs, tell the guy, that's the best part too. When I hand the guy the bag and he's just like, is this it? And I'm like, this is it. He's like, you're not coming? No, this is it. And then you could see there's a second where he, if they've done it before, it's one thing. If they've never done it before, they have the moment too where they're like, oh, this is kind of cool. Even they're like, this is kind of cool. So <laughs> then I'm like, they're, they're always just like, yo, but like, where am I going? Like, am I going to that place? I said, I said, um, as soon as I, step back in i'm going to send you the name and the number of the person you're getting this delivered to so that when you get there you can call them not me they go off i would let's say i'm sending you a drive i share my uber ride with you i send them your number and your address and then i wait and then it's funny because i'll get buzzed on my watch where it's like watch out for bike routes. And then I'll just text you and be like, Hey, if you're not paying attention, that guy's like down the block. Okay. Can I give my quick point of view on that? You may. It sounds like a drug deal <laughs> or, or a bomb threat. Like you're giving someone a package and you're like secure the package. So, so I would be when it's so a little hard drives. And I'm like, and I'm like, yep, just this tiny little thing. And they think they're holding like some precious, yeah. you know, it's funny. It's it sounds like a drug deal that you're getting someone involved and or it's it could be like a bomb. I don't know why my head goes to both of those places, maybe because I'm messed up, but it's very interesting. It's solid, TV. solid TV. But yeah, it's actually been working fantastic. And I use it anywhere in the boroughs. Now, if it's a gigantic drive or if it's incredibly precious, then I'll call an intern down. You know, they'll pick it up. They'll ride it. They'll ride with it in the Uber. So but that's a lot rarer. If scenario. you needed to ship something to me in Long Island, would you Uber it? Um, I would. Well, it, it usually depends on how fast you need it. 
if you need it same day or something or 24 hours, yeah, because it's cheaper than me going to FedEx and overnighting it. It's very interesting. But normally, in the case of uh, when we're done with a project and I'm archiving it and just sending you back all the assets, you don't care when you get it at, the, at that point. So then I'll just drop it off at USPS. I'll make sure there's a tracking that you have to sign for it and you'll get it in, in a week, you know? Hmm. Um, and that's what we've been doing all um, quarantine long. It's kind of wild. I mean, it took a while to figure that out. People were like driving out here put dropping stuff off themselves they still will do that but now that i'm like if you want you can just uber it to me they're like no no and then i'm like yeah yeah you can and they're like really yeah and then then i always say what i always say to get people at ease is i'm like look i understand you might feel nervous about giving a stranger a hard drive but you put yourself in a stranger's car isn't that even more um, you know, daunting. The but answer is, so, yeah. What if they just take it and they don't deliver? Like, I don't know. I it's just, the same that's thing. Very interesting. What if you get in the Uber and the guy wants to murder you? Like, what are they going to do with your hard drive? Usually, I'll be clear. It's not the only, obviously, guys, back shit up, <laughs> you know, yeah. back up your stuff. Yeah, it's not please. the only copy that I, you know, it's, if it was that, it's never been a situation like that. It's like, yeah, I got to get these files to the colorist. I'm just going to shoot I, it over. If something happens on the way, I'll put it on another drive. I'll shoot that one over. Just a recommendation. I think next time you do that to your colorist, could you at least Uber Eats them something at the same time? So you get, like, give them some, like, donuts bad. or something. Like, Here's come a, on, a Dale. You're, you're going to. <laughs> Here's a drive and some mozzarella sticks. It's Enjoy. Some motivation in case they need to get it done quicker. <laughs> come on, Dale. Do you got to. You got to start thinking this That's way. That's the account side, guys. She's only thinking about the people. <laughs> Um, yeah. Isn't that crazy though? But it's been, it's, so it's either been shipping and you don't, you can't imagine and they're shipping it to me. Here's the rule for the agency side for the love of God. Make sure I have to, I have to sign for it because these people are dropping it with my Amazon packages. And I don't realize that I've had the footage for a day, two days down there. Make me sign, please. Especially when it's coming from overseas. We had stuff from Paris come in and Kenya come in recently. It's like, but that's how it's been. That's hilarious. I can't wait to ask people that at work because I'm really curious to know if anyone else has ever done that and I will bring you up by name. <laughs> I just had to, uh, uh, we're working with a good uh, good friend of mine, Zoe and uh, Joe, and Joe <laughs> was curious about the same thing because he, he himself was running all over the city, you know, because he, the people that he worked for weren't comfortable taking the subway and stuff. And that's what happened in the beginning is I started thinking, damn, what am I going to do? Now I'm going to have to ask my assistant to come from the Bronx to Queens to pick up a drive, to take it to Brooklyn, to then go back to the Bronx. That kills half her day. During a pandemic. Yes. Yeah. So this, this is just a much more, obviously once we tried it, I was just as reserved as you were, but it works. And so that's that. That I would say is the biggest change. What we recommend to our clients is look, if it's under, if it's like 50 gigs or under a hundred gigs, then you can use, you know, you can upload it to frame or FTP it on my server and that's fine. Why? Because that takes about a day on most broadband speeds. If it's more, overnight it. Because it's just going to take longer. Unless you don't care about the timeline and you don't care about having to watch this thing upload because, you, you know, we'll get corrupted clips and stuff that way sometimes. Um, so normally they'll ship me something. It'll arrive at my doorstep. I bring it on our server, we do our thing, and then at the end, I ship it back. We use Frame.io to ship small 10, 20 gigs worth of stuff. If Again, because sometimes for the colorist, we can you know just send them a quick time of the video and then Resolve will auto-cut it. But if they really want like the raw, raw, depending on the camera it's shot on, like if it was shot mm -hmm. on the red and they want the red R3D files, I got to send the drive. And so then we'll Uber it. So I hope that the one thing everyone's learned from this is if you do that, you include a donut or some type of meat, like snack with that meal instead of just being like, hey, man, I just Ubered you just one drive versus like you can Uber Eats the guy and be like, here's the location. You got to stop and pick up the package and then you give him a nice little treat and then he gets the job done quicker because he likes a nice gesture. So I it. want you to try that out next time and get back to me. <laughs> pandemic living guys but i'm telling you 
there's a lot of weird ways to do things and, and it totally works. So yeah, thank God for the internet. I guess. I mean, the, the truth is the only time my business is just straight up halted is when it goes down. Here's the deal though, guys, we set it up and this is important for you if you're trying to run anything, right? To me, it's better that you only have one area that could fail than that th four, three or four um, points, right? Of error. So at this point, and then to get into this last topic of tech, I'm going to just tell you how we make this whole thing work. And the internet is the, you know, I'm going to spoil it. It's all based around the internet. And if you didn't have the, when the internet goes down, everything goes down, but that's the only thing that's going to stop us. So what happened with a lot of production companies and post houses, things went local. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like everybody got a drive or everybody got a computer. And now you have situations where if they didn't get a computer from your office, <laughs> they're working on probably not an amazing machine. So we wanted to make sure that we kept the technical standards the same. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do our best to create as much of a, a similar experience as we could. Um, and we wanted to be able to have all of the data stay centralized, okay? So that everyone was still working off of one unified server and people could pass things to each other if they needed it. When you're working locally, it's super hard to get the footage then again to somebody else on your team, right? Because you may have the footage on one drive. Now I have to figure out how to get that footage to them. It's, it's, it's too messy. You know, it's not my style. So what we ended up doing is we ended up getting, you know, um, I, I started doing tons of research at the beginning of this thing. And I saw an awesome video um, from Linus Tech Tips about a remote login software. And a lot of people understand the concept of remoting in, right? As in, you can access your computer from outside of your network. So I can go on and, you know, that's how an IT guy would help you fix your computer mm -hmm. from home. I'm sure that's happened at least once. Somebody from BBDO has helped you. Yes. So it's that same concept, except this program, it's called Parsec. It was, a, it's a gaming program. The whole concept behind it pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. and they've pivoted, I think, in a smart way. But pre-pandemic, the idea was that I would put this on my gaming rig. And then when I went on vacation, if I wanted to play on my gaming rig, I could connect to it remotely and it would have a lag, relatively lag free experience with a high enough quality that it felt like, you know, I was gaming on my PC, just not there. Turns out that application is wonderful for video editing where you really care about the lag being low. You don't care necessarily as much about the video quality because half the time you're working on proxies anyways. Um, you just need to make sure that when you slide it, it slides, right? So mm -hmm. this program has been like essential. The whole thing wouldn't be possible with it, like out it. And right now what you don't see is one, two, three, four workstations all connected to the server. So you get that centralization. It's right off the server the same way that we had it in the office. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed at all. All the computing power done on these workstations, that hasn't changed at all from where it was in the office, right? The only thing you would need is a monitor, a keyboard, and an internet connection. And that's mm -hmm. the one requirement is we make everybody use an ethernet cable and jack into their router. That's it. You have that. You don't need to buy a crazy expensive editing rig now to work from home this way. Um, and that's really what's brought this together is using Frame IO, using Asana, um, and using Parsec to get us to remote in. I've kept the computing level the same. I've kept us all centralized on the server. I think this is like, this was, this is the magic. I'm not going to lie. And it's amazing. And I've had, I've, I've had a more than one person say that they've forgotten like that it wasn't their computer. Wow. Yeah. So there's that. Well, from my standpoint, I can't say too much on the technical side because I'm on the creative end. Um, but what I can talk to is how, um, you know, I would say I'm not on the media side plant buying side or planning side, I'm on the creative side, but I have seen the way that our media agencies have bought media differently, just knowing that, you know, we're mm. consuming media differently. During the pandemic, we're consuming it differently. So it's no surprise to anyone that we're all, you know, watching Netflix or and watching more like online videos. So online video, um, you know, advertising has gone up astronomically we're not necessarily going to the movies anymore so that's not necessarily something people are buying um i would say something that i've noticed has been go going up is influencers 
So knowing that we can't uh -huh. shoot with someone, like they physically shoot have an right? in-person shoot, they can shoot themselves. So you could give them X amount of dollars and they'll take care of everything on their end and just hand us the video. So that's something I feel like that has grown so much this past year. Uh, and it's been a lot easier, I would say for, for everyone across the board, because it's less management, so to speak, because you're not necessarily on the ground making sure they're capturing all the lines, you're giving them all the lines in advance. They're taking control, shooting it on their own at their own leisure and just handing it back to us at a specific date. So, and I would say social. Social still remains at the top. Everyone's on their phones all the time. Maybe not. We're getting Dale. a lot of TikTok. <laughs> We're getting a lot of TikTok <laughs> asks. We're getting a lot of repurposing asks. Mm -hmm. Um I'm going to be doing a uh, working with a monthly client, starting a monthly client with an uh, that's an agency soon. Um, we're one of their big clients is doing, you know, it's going to be a certain number of videos a month and we're just going to be repurposing content that they're grabbing from either their brand ambassadors or whatever. And then there'll be a few shoots throughout the year, but it has, I've seen a trend towards the, the social branded content um, for sure. Yeah. And speaking of TikTok, so I worked on uh, a project for Duncan where we shot with one of the most influential TikTokers um, and the campaign did fantastic. Oh, I think it's- Shout it out then if it's public. Uh, sure. So it's the Charlie D'Amelio campaign. Have you ever heard of the Charlie? You could buy it at your local Duncan. Oh my God, that's funny. I do know her. Uh, she's a famous dancer or something, right? Yeah, well, she's known for dancing, but she is much more than that. <laughs> uh, so she's a 16. She's actually turning 17 this year. Oh, so we, God. Yeah, so we partnered Crazy. with her last year when she was 15, actually, probably just turning 16. Uh, she, her rise to fame was at the beginning of 2020. Obviously, at the time when all of us were, you know, we TikTok started to become popular, obviously, during the pandemic, TikTok blew up because everyone was on their phones all the time. And we noticed that Charlie was purchasing Duncan drinks all the times and doing a shout out saying how much she loved Duncan, that she wanted to marry them. And we noticed, we meaning the agency, we brought it up to client, client loved it. And we started a, a, a conversation with Charlie. We surprised her with merch. She's a young kid, so she loved it and then later down the line we ended up putting her drink on our menu which we've never done before we've never pers had that someone's personalized drink on the menu um and plus the, you know she's a young kid and her demographic is uh those that are i would say going to starbucks and grabbing starbucks drinks at that younger age so we were kind of tapping into that starbucks generation and turning them into duncan drinkers and the campaign did was so successful we sold hundreds of thousands of drinks. And uh, we actually just launched a second follow-up to that campaign, the Charlie Cold Brew. Um, I helped with that one too, and it did so well. So just going back to the whole TikTok, we capitalized on that because it was a growing, you know, growing platform. We realized that the most popular star at on TikTok, we worked with her, got so many views and it ended up working out for us. So technology definitely played a huge role um, in the pandemic and it's all about adapting to, you know, the technology that's thrown at you. What? I, you took the words right out of my mouth. I really wanted to sum up this episode in one word and I would say that adaptation, adaptation, right. Is yeah. the key. And that comes back to the first thing I said, which was, it's all about you, right? You got to sit there and you need to be able to, to adapt. And again, I'll say it again, like I'm a stoic. So, you know, this is, this was like just key, you know, accept the world the way it is you know, and find a way to sort of act within those circumstances that you're given. Um, it's such a simple way to live, but I will say that if it wasn't for, you know, my optimism, if it wasn't for my hunger or my passion or whatever you'd call it, last year would have been a lot more difficult, you know? And I could see that even with my own family members. Yeah, man, having this company saved me, you know? in a weird way because and it's, it, which is funny because I lost it. I, there's nobody here that was here before. Everybody is new. We did literally, we built our brand Bible in the heat of the pandemic as a team. 
like diving deep into the deepest reaches of why the hell was I doing this? What was I even doing for the first two and a half years of this business in the first place? It was wild, but I'm grateful. It makes me think that of a phoenix, Dale, rising oh from the ashes. <laughs> She's referencing our high school. God help us. So adaptation, man. Um, just a couple of small things here. Listen, guys, we if you want, I can I'm happy to share. We do have um, a COVID deck that outlines the things that I spoke about in this episode. Um, a little PDF deck that we sent to our clients. I'm happy to share that with you if you're interested. Um, and just uh, I have one last note here that says, which is true pre-pandemic, but I think it's even more true now. When it comes to the creative process, the bottleneck is always in pre-production. Take more time to plan to figure things out. And as she said, she started getting longer timelines in terms of the pre-pro, right? People are planning mm -hmm. further ahead. Yeah. See, that's good. And stability over speed 100 times out of 100. So it, we took a lot of time and made a lot of mistakes up front before we really launched back up with our clients so that when we started working with them, we knew that this remote thing was good. I had a plan in case anybody wanted to do live work. It has not been asked yet. They've, like I said, I had somebody come in one time, but we do have a setup if we wanted to do like a live session, streaming, things like that. But um, yeah, man, adapt, stay hungry. And I mean, that's it for me. I think that was a nice way to end it. This show is brought to you by my post out straight shot post. And we do branded content and we work with uh, agencies like Melissa's. And so of course, check out our other content. If you're really interested in post-production and uh, content creation, um, there's plenty more uh, where stuff like this came from. Thank you to all our listeners. Of course, we really appreciate it. We'll see you on the next one. See you next time. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the CNA podcast. If this brought you any value, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. You know how much it means.